study biology in popular science fiction TV and movies class. And so basically this week, what we did is we watched um, several TV shows, such as episodes of Star Trek and Futurama, and we went to go see two movies, um, Logan and uh, Kong Skull Island, and then we analyzed the movies and TV shows, um, basically rationalizing them in terms of science. Uh, so today we have a presentation for you, which is the analysis of Kong Skull Island. So a very, very, very brief plot summary. Basically, like all other Kong movies, a bunch of people travel to this isolated island and they encounter a bunch of very large beasts and chaos ensues. Uh, so, yeah. um, so basically, our presentation, um, questions we aim to answer, we broke this down into basically two main questions. The first one being, how did life get to Skull Island? And the second one being, how did the species on Skull Island grow to such large sizes? And we're going to be answering these questions in terms of how lemurs inhabited Madagascar and comparing that to life on Skull Island, and then the effects of the fact that the, ice, the island was isolated on, this, on the size of the species, and then we're gonna be talking about limitations to the size of those species using real science. So our first question to answer is, how did life get to Skull Island? And in our world today, we do have a really good example of an isolated island that had a lot of animals. So Madagascar as a model to compare with Skull Island. So how did animals get to Madagascar? Um, today's most favored theory is that lemurs travel to Madagascar on floating vegetation. It's most supported because um, that's the same theory as how monkeys got to the New World. And throughout Earth's history, there has been a lot of different ocean currents. So it's not unlikely that there was an ocean current leading from Africa's coast towards Madagascar. So how did animals get to Skull Island? Um, Skull Island has a lot more difficulties because the island is surrounded by an electrical storm barrier and it's very difficult to get through. <laughs> um, and it's also very far from the mainland. So we thought maybe um, maybe the storm barrier wasn't always there. There might be these pockets of openings that animals could have gone through on vegetation floats, and maybe there was an ocean current that led to the island. But in the movie, they um, they have a theory called the hollow earth theory. And it's basically that underground there's a lot of tunnels, and inside those tunnels there's prehistoric life, and it's very majestic monsters and stuff. So maybe um, in the movie, people or creatures traveled to the island through the earth. So here's a comparison of Madagascar and Skull Island. The main thing is that Madagascar is much bigger than Skull Island. So it's, it's as big as uh, California, and Skull Island's pretty walkable. Um, in the movie, you can see that. Uh, Madagascar's location is off the coast of Africa, and Skull Island is in the Coral Sea, which is off the coast of Australia. These are the coordinates provided by discoverskullisland.com. <laughs> uh, Madagascar is really big, so it has a wide variety of climates, but Skull Island's small size doesn't have as much variety, and then there's a giant cyclone surrounding it. Um, and then Madagascar is a lot more diverse than Skull Island. You don't really see that much diversity in the movie, at least. So due to the uh, large diversity of um, ecological niches that exist on Madagascar, when uh, lemurs first arrived on the island, they were able to um, adapt to each of these niches and also with the lack of predators, they were able to diversify into um, many species where a large portion of the over 200 species of mammals that we find on Madagascar are lemurs. Um, now on Skull Island, Skull Island is a lot smaller than Madagascar, so there's a lot less diverse um, environments for animals to adapt to, but also there's a high presence of predators that exist. Um, so uh, we see a lot more limited um, diverse species, hence why there's only one Kong on the island. Um, so we also did a comparison to figure out uh, how long ago Kong diverged from uh, the gorilla line. So we did a proportion between the weight of a porpoise and a blue whale, and from genetic data that we have, we know that those two diverged 34 million years ago. And so we extrapolated that to Kong and a gorilla, and the ratio came out to be about 1.9 million years ago as our estimate. So the second question we're gonna be talking about is how did the species on Skull Island uh, grow so large? So the first principle that we're gonna be talking about is something called island gigantism. So basically this principle states that on an isolated island, uh, animals that are small species will evolve to become larger and 
uh, larger species will evolve to become smaller, and we see this in uh, Skull Island. So we have a, an example of a very large spider and a very large water buffalo, but we see that proportionately the spider is a lot bigger than the water buffalo, so this follows the principle of island uh, gigantism because um, the spider grew to a larger extent than the water buffalo did. And then secondly, uh, we can see that the reason Kong might be so large is because island gigantism um, talks about territorial animals in the sense that um, animals that are territorial are able to grow larger. And Kong was basically the protector of this island, so uh, it makes sense that he would be uh, such a large size. So one of the species that we see on this island are these giant spiders known as mother longlegs. Um, and so it's a giant spider with long, thin legs that appear like bamboo, along with um, eight eyes on the top of its body. So here's a little gift from the movie. Um, so <laughs> the science fiction of this uh, spider is that it's an arachnid, and arachnids don't have lungs. And so in order for it to get enough oxygen to grow to this size, it's implausible because the atmosphere currently doesn't have this much oxygen. And um, earlier forms of the earth there was, so they could grow to this size, but currently we don't. Um, its leg size also isn't big enough to support its body mass. Uh, the long, thin legs just proportionally aren't big enough. Um, and as well, it hunts um, prey that are in the forest beneath it. So it doesn't make sense that its eyes would adapt to be on top of its head rather than on its bottom. Um, however, it could exist if the island had a higher oxygen content that was more similar to uh, prehistoric Earth than modern day Earth. So it's possible. And also, the largest arachnid species that's ever been discovered on Earth is the um, the giant huntsman spider, which has been captured to grow to one foot in size. So it is possible that if the right con uh, concentration of oxygen was present, it could become a giant spider. <laughs> so the main antagonist creature in the movie are the skull crawlers. They're these giant monsters, like reptile, amphibian-like creatures. I'm not really sure. Um, they don't have hind legs, they just have a tail. And they live primarily underground, but research. So we had two questions about um, the skull crawlers. The first one is, why do they still have eyes if they live underground? So a lot of underground creatures that we know of today have lost their eyes because they're not really beneficial underground. But we came up with a couple explanations for why they still have eyes. So um, in the movie, they have been shown to resurface when disturbed underground. And then also they just, sorry. They also just need, um, they can't, they might not be able to get enough prey underground, so they have to resurface um, to the surface to be able to um, hunt, and then in that case, it would be favorable to have those eyes. Why would they lose their tails? So um, we have an example of a prehistoric creature that is kind of similar to the skull crawler. It's the mosasaur, and it, it has like a tail and some back flippers, but they're in the process of being lost through evolution. So we thought that maybe the skull crawlers lost um, uh, evolved from the mosasaurs, and this, the tail may be useful for hunting underwater since underground they might not have enough resources, similarly to how they have to go above ground to hunt. Sorry. And then it's also helpful with movement and um, catch, catching their prey. <coughs> okay. And lastly, we're going to look at Kong. So the difference between gor gorillas and Kong in the movie is that in the movie you see them eat squid, whereas gorillas are usually herbivores. Um, we also see that in the movie, he's able to tell um, the difference between people that he needs to kill versus people that he needs to protect. And we believe that he could have developed more space um, for his brain by um, losing his occipital ridge, which would have been used to um, eat plants that he, he's not shown eating in the movie. And there's a lot of things wrong with Kong in the movie because it would be hard to pump blood throughout such a big animal unless he has a larger and stronger heart or he would have to have multiple hearts, which isn't as crazy as it sounds. Mm -hmm. And um, as for scaling of Kong and the, and the square cube law, if you were to take an animal, just a gorilla, and double the size of this gorilla, you would have eight times the weight and four times the bone area and that in itself it doesn't make a lot of sense. It would be, it would be very hard to support um, his body weight. And you can compensate for this by having, um, I think it was like shorter legs, stronger muscles, things like that, but only up to a certain size. So Kong in general should not be moving and active like he is in the movie. So yeah. 
And thank you so much. If you have any questions, come to us at the table. We like talking about biology and science fiction, so yeah.